Good morning, welcome to Cormier in the Italian Alps on the Italian side of Mont Blanc. Uh, on this day two years ago I passed through Cormier as part of the Tour de Mont Blanc hike, which is a hundred mile loop through Italy, France and Switzerland. It was the first long distance backpacking trip I ever did and yeah, it was incredible. If you ever look up a list of the world's best hikes, it's always on there and for good reason. You really do pass it through some incredible scenery. So good in fact that this past week I came back and hiked the first four sections again. But if I combine camping and hiking trip, I just wanted to do some of the higher level routes that I didn't do the first time. So once again, I had a great time, great views, great weather, met some very good people along the way. So it occurred to me I should probably make a short video, sort of tips and advice for people thinking of doing the walk. Um, I thoroughly recommend it. It is a challenging walk, and I'll come to that. But the views and the experience more than make up for it. So what I've done is I've ditched my camping gear in Cormier and swapped it for a lightweight day pack. And I'm going to hike the Cormier section of the TMB, which is considered one of the top three stages of it. Um, so hopefully along the way you'll get a flavour of what to expect if you do the walk. And I'll throw in some tips and advice for people planning and doing it, which hopefully you'll find useful. So I mentioned earlier that the Tour de Mont Blanc is a 100 mile hiking loop. So obviously being a loop that means you can start wherever you want. The traditional starting point is the picturesque French village of Les Uches, which sits right below Mont Blanc and it's this popular starting point for people, mountaineers, looking to climb that mountain. Les Uches is easily accessible from Geneva Airport. It's about a one hour bus drive from there, so it's easy to get to, especially if you're coming from the UK. Other people do start to walk here in Cormier or Champagne in Switzerland, so it's really up to you. Wherever you start, obviously the distance is the same, 100 miles or just over. Most people take 10 or 11 days to walk that. Now that might seem slow, 10 miles a day, but the distance isn't really the issue in this walk, as you can tell by my, my breath. It's the elevation gain. From start to finish, the walk involves a total ascent of 10,000 meters or 30,000 feet. So to put that in perspective, that's the equivalent of starting from sea level, climbing to the top of Mount Everest and still having 2,000 feet to go. So it is steep. <laughs> So don't take it for granted or underestimate it if you're planning to do this walk. Uh, get in shape beforehand and you'll appreciate it a lot more. I um, haven't got much further to go before I reach Bertoni and looking forward to get a bit of freshness there. It's a good time to talk about accommodation on the Tour de Mont Blanc. Obviously a lot of people do choose to stay in the refuges or a combination of the refuges and hotels which are certainly easy to come by in the larger villages and towns that you pass through. And you can certainly see the appeal of doing that and you can pay tour companies to transport larger items or your larger bag between refuge to refuge or refuge to hotel which obviously means that the weight you're carrying each day is a lot less and over the course of a long walk like this that can make a big difference to make it a lot easier for you. Um, a few things to mention about the refuges, you can expect to pay about 50 to 70 euros a night to stay in them and I would say that they vary massively in quality. The ones I have personal experience of and would recommend would be ones like Refuge Bonatti, which is on today's walk, uh, the one at Lac Combal, which I think is excellent, and Refuge de Motet. The competition for the refuges is pretty uh, tight, there's a lot of people who do the walk and want to stay in them, so you do have to book in advance. Obviously if you go with a tour company they'll take care of all that for you. Other people sort of book as they go, but if you have no other plan, like you don't have a tent with you and you're booking it one day in advance here and there and hoping to turn up and, and stay in a refuge, just be prepared that you could come unstuck a wee bit there and have nowhere to stay. Which is one of the reasons why I chose to camp, or when I say camp, I, the majority of it I camped. There's some sections where I did stay in refuges for a couple of reasons. Um, the camping setup isn't great. Now having done it, there certainly are good campsites along the way and I'll link to those in the description of the video. Uh, but what I chose to do was camp the majority of it, so I always had the option of somewhere to stay at night in the tent. Uh, but I did mix in a few refuges where there were sections that there were large gaps where you couldn't really uh, camp. I have known people who have camped the full thing and stayed uh, sort of wild camped along the way. Now, wild camping, strictly speaking, isn't legal here or allowed here. But I know a lot of people have done it without problems, and I think as long as you're discreet and maybe practice, you know, good responsible camping, leave no trace and things, that you might be okay. But because it's not strictly allowed, I suppose you could be asked to move on or maybe find. I don't know. I have no experience of, of doing that. That's the accommodation set up uh, in brief. I'll leave some links in the description with more information.
was walking along the trail there, just minding my own business, um, admiring the views, which as you can see are pretty impressive. When I heard a lot of rustling on the left hand side and looked up and a goat appeared just in front of me with these huge big horns. Uh, first I thought he was going to attack me, but he was quite friendly. I think he was just more interested in what I had to eat, if anything. But he started to chew my shoelaces, I had to leave him be. So that's definitely my closest brush with nature on the tour. Um, if you do the walk, you're quite likely to see some marmots, which are quite funny, chubby little rodents. And when you approach, you hear them make this noise to warn all their friends that there's people coming. Uh, you also might be lucky to see some ibex mountain goats. Again, they have these huge big horns and pretty impressive when you see them, especially up close. Apart from that, you'll encounter a lot of cows with traditional bells around their necks. They make that jingling noise so the farmers can find them in bad weather. And Quite a nice sound actually from a distance when you're up close, especially if you're camping, it can get a bit frustrating. But it's all part of the experience and the uh, sort of traditional part of alpine life here in the Alps. So uh, definitely my closest encounter with wildlife so far, but I uh, came out of it unscathed, so time to keep on walking. In terms of weather for the walk, the window for walking the Alps is very narrow. Really it runs from end of June to the middle of September. Um, if you do the walk in the end of June, you do have to be very careful. It's quite likely that snow will still be lingering in the passes that you'll go through. And some of those passes are sort of up as high as 2,500 metres. I started the walk on the 12th of July and even then, one of the passes I did on the second day, there was still snow at about 2,000 metre level there. And the ground wasn't too steep. So it wasn't a problem, but if you want to do some of the steeper sections, like the variants, you'd have to be careful with the snow and check, ideally from people up ahead. You can ask at refuges what the conditions are like further on, uh, because you don't want to get caught out, as a few people I spoke to did, um, traversing very steep slopes and snow without any crampons or ice axes or things. A slip there could be pretty dangerous. Uh, having said that, the, the weather in the Alps is generally relatively stable. The Tour de Mont Blanc generally takes about 10 or 11 days, and you'd be quite unlucky if you got rained on for the majority of that you could expect maybe six or seven of those days to be good and you might luck out as I did and every day was good. So just check the forecast uh, day to day and that will kind of determine whether you can take the low route or the high route uh, and also when to take refuge in the shelters. It's quite common in the Alps that there will be afternoon thunderstorms so as long as you time your walk that you'll be hitting the refuge at that point you should be okay and it quickly then clears and weather go back to being stable. So I say summertime in the Alps is generally good for walking but just keep a, uh, an eye on the forecast. Being in the high mountains, it can change quite a lot pretty quickly, so try to get up to the end information, you should be okay. Halfway through today's walk, so I just stopped to have my lunch there and a nice wee ledge I found with a good view of Mont Blanc. So, definitely worse places to have your lunch than here. Uh, it's a good chance to talk about food on the tour, which is one of the real highlights. Well, for me at least, it was. Um, obviously, you're going through Italy, France, and Switzerland, so for me, that means a diet of a pretty unhealthy diet of baguettes, cheese, and dark chocolate, which is what I've been surviving on. In terms of how much you carry, it depends really where you're staying. If you're going hut to hut and hotel to hotel, you really don't need to carry very much food because I think the longest maybe you go without passing the refuge is about five or six miles. Um, the refuges can be expensive, you know, for sandwiches and things you can be paying sort of nine euros depending on where you are. Switzerland is obviously the most expensive place of them all. I think my record there was paying eight euros for a Snickers bar, which is tough to do, but when in need. Uh, I was pretty hungry at that stage and there's nothing else on offer. So the reason it's so expensive is some of those remote refuges that have to get thing, foods in and supplies in by helicopter. So it's understandable and I don't really begrudge paying the refuges the money because they're a big part of the tourist industry here and do serve the hikers very well. So if you're camping, I would suggest maybe carrying a day or two days worth of food. I really don't think you need much more than that. You do pass through a lot of, uh, let's say, refuges where you can stock up in smaller things, bags of nuts and chocolate bars, and then you come into some larger towns. Um, I'll leave a link in the description or a note in the description of the video to say where the best um, supermarkets and things that I've found are. There's quite a few of them. And again, sort of every day or every other day you pass through one of those. So in terms of food, uh, I would just eat as much as you can along the way because you're going to burn off those calories on the uphills. I would say if you're like me and eat a diet of baguettes and cheese to bring a Swiss army knife with you, definitely helpful when you're cutting through those baguettes, which especially in France are really, really nice, but really, really tough. So that's what I find work for me anyway.
So just a quick comment about the type of terrain you can expect to find on the uh, Tour de Mont Blanc. Really it's a mixed bag. In some places the path is very, very good, sort of smooth single track. In other places like here, it's very, very poor. As you can see, it's just tree roots, loose scree, um, all sorts of things that snag you and trip you up. Not only is the path often rocky and uneven, but in some places it's very exposed, the steep drops off to the side, so you really do need to be careful on what you're fitting in those sections, because a fall there could definitely be serious. And in other sections, especially if you do some of the higher level variants, you can expect to do a bit of scrambling across large boulders or rocks. Now, in some places they help with installed metal guide railings or chains, but other places don't have them, so again you have to be careful there too. And the final thing I would say is on the French side of the walk, near Lac Blanc, there's a series of almost vertical ladders to climb, bolted to the rock face. Now, if you don't have a good head for heights, I suggest maybe avoiding that section. There are workarounds, and you can check the blogs and the guidebooks and see what those are and take alternate routes. Footwear is a matter of personal preference. I prefer to wear trail running shoes. I just find they're more breathable and lighter weight. And over a long walk like this, that can make quite a bit of a difference. But I know people like to wear boots, especially if they're carrying heavier packs and things. So it's really up to you. I would say whatever shoes you choose, just make sure they're durable and they have a good toe cap. It's one of the things I've found is when you're walking along, uh, you look up to take in some of the views, and you stub your toe on a rock and you trip, <laughs> much to the amusement of the people behind you. So it seems to happen to everybody, and if you do this walk, it'll probably happen to you. Just something to be aware of. The path is very rough in parts, and it'll be very easy to trip and take a tumble, especially in the descent, so just be careful. Coming to the end of today's walk, which is a good time, I suppose, to talk about uh, navigation here. Um, the trail's very well waymarked, but you pass are signs which will point you in different directions, both the low routes and the high routes, and they'll also give you an estimate of how long it's likely to take you to get there. The, the signs are maybe a few miles apart. In between, then you'll have trees or stones marked with the TMB logo. I would recommend you bring a guidebook. Put a link up in the description of the one I'm using at the minute, which I find to be very useful. I might just put it up on screen. Navigation isn't too much of an issue. Obviously, you're in the high mountains, so I would suggest that you do bring maps, uh, sort of 125,000 scale maps, in case the visibility got really bad. But definitely, the sensible thing to do would be to have maps just in case. So yeah, the way markings are good. Um, path is generally easy to follow, and there's also a lot of people about, so. If you're doing the walk by yourself, uh, as I tend to do, it's quite uh, comforting to know if something was to happen, there's probably help on hand. Well, after a fantastic day of hiking through some of the best scenery the Alps has to offer, I arrived at Refugio Bonati, which has a well-deserved reputation for being one of the best refuges in the Alps. It certainly has some of the best views, so I took time to soak it all in and reflect on the past week of hiking in the Tour de Blanc, Blanc Trail. I hope this video has given you an idea of what the hike is like and as I said at the start of this video I do highly recommend it, it really is a fantastic experience. So for anyone watching this video I hope you get a chance to do the walk and if you do I hope you enjoy it as much as I did.